him. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'd remind you we have a, a very important informational meeting tonight. Uh, if I could make it mandatory in a voluntary society, I would do so. It's critical that you be here. It's an update of what we discussed and voted on October the 9th. Bring you up to date on some remediation matters and also a report on uh, matters in Dejun, Haiti. So please get here at 6 o'clock tonight so we can look at these things and get our minds and hearts together as a congregation, to move together as one, to speak as one, to do and act as one. First Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 16 to 23 today. Uh, the overarching theme of the study of this letter is that uh, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. Uh, all churches are imperfect churches. I remind you of the preacher that uh, when I was young, uh, in the, beginning in the ministry, and he was, he was at the latter years of his ministry, uh, he said to me uh, when I was in seminary, he said, Son, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll mess it up. So uh, that's just true of all of us, isn't it? So it's a Perfect gospel for an imperfect church. Today we're looking specifically at the church as the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. Stand with me if you would, if you found 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 23 in your Bible. Uh, if not, we have the text on the screen for you, but I really want you to have your own Bible. And If you don't have one, see me and we'll make arrangements for you to have your own copy of Holy Scripture. Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple <clears throat> and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he might become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to see today that God takes very seriously the well-being of his temple, his church. And he takes very seriously his action toward those who would harm that which he finds precious. Thank you. Please be seated. Paul is still... Since the early verses of chapter 1, he is still dealing with this matter of divisions within the church at Corinth. Uh, specifically, the outcropping of it, the manifestation of it, is that uh, they were choosing preachers, their favorite preacher. They were uh, choosing one against the other. I like Peter better than I like Apollos. Well, I like Apollos better than I like Paul. Well, I like Paul better than both. And there was this, there was this friction, there was this division, because they were uh, missing the boat here on on, then you're going to see how Paul points out that they're missing the boat in our text today. He wants these Corinthian Christians to know <clears throat> that as blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ who've been added to his church by grace through faith, they are part of the temple of God whom God loves, and that anyone who does anything to harm God's spiritual temple will in turn be destroyed by God. Divisiveness, party spirit, fascination with worldly wisdom, preacher worship, all of this causes harm to the church and distracts from the precious gifts that God has given to his church. You're going to hear themes in this passage that remind you of, of Romans chapter 8, of Ephesians chapter 4. These are, these are heart themes for the Apostle Paul. They're central to the well-being of any congregation. I want you to see in this text for just a few minutes this morning four things <clears throat> that I think are pertinent. First of all, we see God's love for his church. 
And secondly, we see God's anger toward those who would harm his church. Third, we see God's warning against self-deception and worldly wisdom. And then fourth, we see God's gracious gifts to his church. In other words, his love for his church is manifested as he not only gave Jesus Christ to die for the church, but also gives the church gifts for the well-being of the church. So let's look first of all at this, this idea of God's love for his church. Look at verse 16 with me. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, when he says this here, he's using, in fact, if you, if you looked at the, if you could see the text, there's some, there's some commentaries I found. I think it's the uh, Hendrickson commentary series that when it, when it recites passages, if the you is plural, if you have a set of these commentaries, you'll notice that if the you is plural, it's, it's the Y-O-U is spread out. There's more spacing between the letters, and there would be typically Y-O-U if it was singular. And, and, and this is one of those cases where the you is plural. Do you, plural, not know that you, plural, are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you, plural. What's the point of that? He's talking about the church. It is, it is true that each person that's born again is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to a sinner dead in trespasses and sins, quickens him to life through the gospel as the means of bringing life, and then in giving that person new birth enables him to repent and believe the gospel and the Spirit then indwells him. And so, so there's a truth that, and he's going to see this in, in chapter 6. We're going to see this. I'll show you this in just a minute, <clears throat> where he speaks of, of our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the church, God's temple. This idea of the temple, you'll remember, we, we studied this on Sunday nights recently, <clears throat> that God signaled his presence in the temple by filling it with the cloud of his glory, the Shekinah. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8. Verses 10 and 11. First Kings 8, 10 and 11. It says, when the priest came out of the holy place, this is, uh, this is the temple here, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the, house, of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The Shekinah. When God would meet with his people, he would descend in a cloud upon, upon the place. It was bright. It was brilliant. It was incredibly uh, astounding. But it was the symbol of his presence. And Paul, Paul is using something of this. When, when you gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus promised there were two or three are gathered in my name. And then according to... You can use the name of Jesus in vain, clearly, but when you're gathered in his name, that is according to who he is, what he came to do, what he has accomplished in you, what he would have you to go forward to accomplish on his behalf, gathered in his name. When two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst. He's promised to give us the Holy Spirit. We have every reason to believe that this gathering, no matter what the size, whether it's just a few of us or whether it's, it's, it's thousands, that a gathering coming together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can invite the Holy Spirit in and say, be our guest, come and, and manifest yourself among us, which we should, we should not presume or assume. And he is here. He is here in our midst. And because God has shed the blood of his Son for Christians who make up his churches, and because God has given the Holy Spirit to dwell in our midst, to teach us this truth, he is very, very jealous for the well-being of his churches. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I referenced a minute ago. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? There's the, there's the idea of the singular there within you as individuals. It's, he's going to talk about this. We're going to look at this when we get to 1 Corinthians 6 about how we ought to live our lives in such a way as not to, not to abuse you're not your own. He goes on and says, you're bought with the price, therefore glorify God with your body. That's, that's the individual manifestation. Today we're talking about the plural, the congregational, the corporate manifestation of God dwelling in us. It's the same thing he said in Colossians, by the way. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you look at that passage, it's a plural you. Christ in the midst of you is the hope of glory. He warned a church in the book of the Revelation in chapter 3, Laodicea, 
that they were meeting without him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus says to that church, I'm on the outside of what you're doing. You're carrying on without me in my name. You, you think you're doing pretty well, but I'm on the outside. So it's critical for us to know that we must, we must come together for the purposes of God, for the glory of God, for the advance of the gospel, to gather for any other reason, to make major those things that are minor and miss the major that God has given us. Is something that does not please God. So he loves his church. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Christ loved the church and laid down his life for the church. Mark it down, brothers and sisters. God loves his church. He is jealous for his church. His name is on his church. Because of that, number two, he manifests anger, a righteous anger toward those who would harm his church. <clears throat> Paul has just asked, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, <clears throat> how would they destroy it? Well, by, by manifesting ungodly attitudes by going after agendas that are not God's agenda, by making the uh, incidental things the major things, <clears throat> by choosing sides, by undermining the ministry, by withholding from the ministry, by, by half-heartedly approaching. There, all these things can destroy the well-being of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see, some people would read this and say, well, that was the God, the God of the Old Testament destroyed things. This is the New Testament, folks. This is the New Testament. Ask Ananias and Sapphira about God. They undermined the work of the early church, and God struck them dead. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. That's sober. I have to ask myself, over and over. You need to ask yourself over and over. Am I contributing? In God's eyes, forget what people think. In God's eyes, am I manifesting and contributing to the well-being and the building up of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I, in God's eyes, destroying it? Whether actively, aggressively, intentionally, or passively, complacently, nonchalantly. There's no middle ground. We're either building up or by not building up. Think about the principle here. If you let your lawn go, you're not actively, intentionally taking care of the lawn or house, just anything. It does not remain neutral. Weeds grow. Growth overtakes. Things begin to deteriorate. So it's not enough for us to think, well, but I'm, I'm not going around sowing seeds of discord. You see, I think Paul's speaking here to more than just the folks who were vocally identifying the preacher they preferred. I think he's speaking to the whole congregation and implying in this that those who were standing by letting it happen, in fact, it's going to get more intense in chapter 5 when he just rebukes them for, for closing their eyes to a situ, situation of open immorality in the church. We've got to do the heart searching and ask the questions, am I intentionally building up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I maybe not intentionally and aggressively tearing it down, but by complacency and apathy, am I allowing it to atrophy? Either way, God says, if you destroy my temple, I'll destroy you. Four, here's the reason, for God's temple is holy. You see, his name is holy. God's temple is holy, and you are, you plural, again, are that temple. The 
The Lord describes himself. The first description he has that he gives of himself, the primary description he gives, is I am holy. And then he admonishes Old Testament believers, and it's cited in the New Testament. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you study through the Old Testament, in the days of the wanderings, in the days of, of the taking of the land of Canaan, the nations feared the people of God. They feared them because the name of Yahweh was upon them. And they trembled to think that the people who are loved by Yahweh were coming their way. In fact, you can read instances, we've looked at this, where they, where they put the choir out in front of the army marching. What do you think that would do for your choir registration? Singing in the choir, by the way, means you're on the front lines of battle. Put the choir in front, and they would go forth singing praise to God, and, and the voices of the people praising God would cause the enemies of God to tremble, knowing that those whom God has used to destroy other peoples are coming our way as well. You can almost picture a scenario like we saw in, in Desert Storm 1 where, where when, the, when the, the, the Red Guard, the Iraqi Red Guard of, Muhammad, of, of uh, Hussein, went out and surrendered. They sur remember, they surrendered to the CNN uh, news reporters. The fiercest part of the fighting army of Saddam Hussein surrendered to supporters when they heard the American army was coming. That's the kind of scenario you had in the Old Testament many times. The holiness of God was upon his people, and it was powerful. It was, it was palpable. And Paul is using that picture in the New Testament context. God's temple is holy. If he has saved you by grace through faith and, and added you into the family of, so that you are, as Peter says, you're, and when you come to him, the living stone, as a living stone, you're, be built, you're being built up into a temple. It's holy to God. And so the fabric of the congregation, we ought to be jealous for the well-being, for the health, for the gospel advance, for the mission imperative, for the great commission command. We ought to be jealous of these things. We cannot be complacent about them. God doesn't always destroy by taking life. Sometimes he destroys by removing his hand. There are churches, hundreds of churches, that close their doors every year. What do we think about that? God's name is holy. And if it's on his church, his name is on his church, then he calls upon us to be jealous of his name and jealous of the agenda he has given us says, and you are that temple. Well, the third thing I want you to see is God's warning against self-deception and worldly wisdom. And this is where Paul's getting down to the heart of the matter. He thinks that's what's going on here, how these people in Corinth could, could choose one preacher over another. Think about the climate they came out of. There were these, these wise philosophers, and you, you wanted to be identified by a particular school of philosophy. The Jews were much the same way. They had their, they had their rabbinic schools and their, their rabbis, and they would, uh, they would side up with the rabbi of their preference. We, folks, we do it today. I mean, we do it, and it's, it's sometimes harmless, but the principle's still there. Or we choose one, one team over another team and, and, and get really zealous for that team. And, and I talk to some people, I know some people, know, when they're talking about a pro team that they've never had a piece of stock in, they've never been asked for any input on it. Well, we, we're doing pretty well this year. We, we've got some real challenges. In we, they don't even know you. So it's, it's a mentality is what I'm saying to you. And it was present in the church at Corinth in a very uh, debilitating way. Look at what he says. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age. In other words, if, the context here is, if you think it's wise for you to choose Apollos 
over Paul or to choose Paul. Paul was like, to choose me over Paul, Apollos or Peter. If you think it's wise, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Rather than, rather than wanting to be thought of as wise in the eyes of the world, Paul says you ought to be willing to be thought of as a fool. A person who is a fool and knows he's a fool and cares not to be a fool is a teachable person, right? I'll tell you about my ethics professor uh, that I had in seminary. The first time I took him was for a four-hour course. He walked in the first day of class. He handed out what we learned was the final exam. He said, I want you to put your names on the top of it, answer these questions, I'll be back at the end of class. He walked out. Well, one of the things you discover in seminary is when you first get into seminary, you, you learn a little thing, a few things, and you think you know everything, and, and you really don't. Forty-something years later, I still don't. So he handed us the final exam, and he left. I'm kind of looking around. A lot of it was essay. You know, I mean, is it, uh, are we supposed to blow smoke here? Just, you know. And he came back in at the end of class, took up the test. He said, how many of you think you did pretty well on this? Nobody raised a hand. How many of you think that you, uh, that you had a good grasp of the material requested? Nobody raised a hand. He said, good. Now that you know that you don't know, maybe you'll be in a position to want to know and learn. Paul says that here. Think you're wise in this age? Become a fool that he may become wise. That's the path. When you, when you don't, when you know you don't know everything, you're willing to listen to learn. Four, the wisdom of this world is folly with God. The wisdom of this world is folly. He's already said this, by the way. We've, we've been looking at this previously in 1 Corinthians. He's just bringing it up again. In 1 Corinthians 1.20, for example. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Because as we pointed out when we were looking at that passage, Isaiah said, Speaking for God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above yours. The prophet would ask the question, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Paul would repeat that in the New Testament. Job at one point made the mistake of saying, I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask God. I've got some questions I'm going to ask God, and he will answer me. And God, who's been silent through that book for most of it, breaks in and says, Who is this who darkens my counsel with words that have no knowledge to them? The wisdom of this world is folly to God. And then he cites a couple of passages. For it is written, he catches the wise in their snare, their craftiness. That's Job 5.13. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. It reminds you of Psalm 2, doesn't it? Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth join together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder. We'll not, we'll not have this one to rule over us. We'll do our own thing, go our own way. And the answer in Psalm 2 is, he who sits in the heavens laughs at such. He mocks such thinking with sore, with serious derision. That's what Paul's talking about here. He catches the wise in their craftiness. Sometimes Paul gives worldly wisdom just enough rope to hang itself. The Lord does that. So, he goes on and says, again in verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are Futile. This is Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath, is what the psalm says. So, 
The warning here is not, is not don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't Im imbibe and embrace the thinking of the world. Now, if there's any question uh, in the past whether or not the thinking of the world is madness, that should be completely removed at this point. People have gone stark, raving mad. And we don't need to just retreat into bunkers, but we need to be sure that our thoughts are lining up with God's thoughts as revealed in his word. Even willing, risking to be called a fool, to be called a bigot, to be called a racist, to be called a homophobe, just speaking the truth of God. Speaking it in love, to be sure. My Greek professor, Curtis Vaughn, I've told you this before, little short fellow, wiry fellow, but I'm telling you, he, he was a master teacher. And he had, he had a, a pointer finger. Then when he would point it at you, it seemed as if it grew. It, it, was, it was almost like 3D. You know, you're sitting in a 3D movie and the, and the arrow comes at you and it's like it just... And there was, we were in class one day studying a passage and, and, and he was laying it out. It was First Thessalonians, I think. And a, and, a, and a student said, but Dr. Vaughn, I, I don't think that's what that passage said. I, I thought, are you kidding me? You're, you're in your second year of seminary. Are you going to take on this guy? And so Dr. Vaughn pulled his glasses down. He said, well, what do you mean? Well, I, I've always thought, that's, of course, that's not true, because he hadn't always thought about the passage. It probably popped up to him that day. But I've always thought, da 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 so Dr. Vaughn had his glasses down, pointed at him, and it, it, was, it was almost like you wanted to dodge, like the finger was going to reach out and just touch him right there. He said, young man, where do you get your thoughts about God? Because if you don't get them from this book, then they're not worth thinking. <laughs> it made an impact on me. That's what Paul's chatting the Corinthians about here. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile because they're, they're not anchored in his revelation of himself. And so, that brings us to number four. God's gracious gifts to his church. Here's what Paul wants to says. So therefore, so now he's, he's kind of, he's drawing a conclusion to what he's been saying to them. So, let no one boast in men. You think he's still thinking about this? Matter from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I guarantee you he is. Let no one boast in men. In other words, don't I follow Apollos, I follow Peter, I follow Paul. Let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. Think what he's saying to them here. You folks that are saying you follow Paul, God graciously gave you Apollos for a season. God graciously gave you Peter for a season. Not only Paul, but Apollos and Peter, all are gifts of God. Ephesians chapter 4, right? He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastor teachers, some evangelists for the equipping of the saints, do the work of the ministry. Those are gifts. Let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Why would you basically say to God, God, I really appreciate this gift, but I tell you what, I despise that. That one I could have done without. You could have kept that one, God. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, and then he goes beyond that. All things, whether the world or life or death or the present or the future, it sounds very much like Romans chapter 8. I'm persuaded that neither life nor death we will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. All are yours. God gives ministers to churches, to ministries for a season, and he gives others. And the people of God, we're not thinking like the world, but thinking the thoughts of God and the, and the mind of God, the revelation of God, are, they appreciate the different gifts of God. And they thank God, and they, and they act thankfully toward God for that. All are yours. 
The world is yours. He's saying, why would you, why would you want to absorb from the world when you're placed here to overcome the world? Life. Don't waste your life. That's the book, by the way, that we gave our graduates last week. Don't waste your life by John Piper. Live life for the glory of God. Death. Come to death to embrace even death as a gift of God, as a way to transport from this life to, e to the life to come, to experience the fullness of eternal life in heaven. What you're living in now is, is from God. It's, it's yours given by God. Why waste it? Why ignore it? Why miss it? And the future. Why get bogged down and miss the anticipation of what John Piper calls the greater glory of God, the, 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 the future of uh, future grace. All are yours. All are yours. He's given us all things for life and godliness, the Scripture teaches. Why, why act as if you prefer one of his gifts over another? Why, why act as if you despise what he does? Be content and be grateful. That's what Paul's calling them to. And you are Christ's. See, it's, it's not just that God has given you all things needful for life and godliness. It's not just that God has given you all these remarkable gifts of grace and mercy and sustaining providences. And the promise that you will persevere to the end, that he will carry you by the Spirit to your final destination of heaven. It's not only that he has given, but he has given you to Christ. You are Christ's. The church of the living God belongs to Jesus Christ. It is really not finally so important what I think or how I feel or how you feel. Or what, it is what would Jesus Christ, the head of the church, have us do? We belong to him. This church is his. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's his. That's the point. You are Christ's. And Christ is God's. And for a church to spend its energies or to misspend its energies on things that are destructive of its well-being is to incur the just indignation of a holy God who owns it all. All things are yours. You are Christ's. Christ is God's. Because you finally, brothers and sisters, we will all appear before the judgment seat. We will give an account. Think about people I've met through the years. A couple of folks in particular. You know people that have a reputation of, of destroying churches. They go from church to church and destroy them. Can you imagine that person who, who claims to be a Christian standing before the Lord God on the final day and him saying, now let me get your resume right here. You went to this church and you were part of running off the preacher and this that, and the other. And then you left and you went to this church and then you you got that preacher run off and then you you went to the, and and you're here naming the name of Jesus because what? Let me get this right. You sowed seeds of discord. You went behind, you were a backbiter. You were a gossip. You were a slanderer. That was your mark and trade as a professing Christian. And you stand here now having done mischief to that for which my son died. And you want to come in. Why? That's how seriously Paul is taking what's happening in Corinth. I want to read to you Romans 8, verse 17, which we read earlier. And then verses 37 and 38. If children, then heirs... Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Not make his people suffer, suffer with him, in order that we also may be glorified with him. Verse 38, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
The Hebrew writer says it this way in chapter 1, verse 2. In these last days, he, that is God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The question I ask myself is, do I live and act as an heir of Jesus Christ? In other words, do I live and act as if I'm under the authority of Jesus Christ, as if I really want the name of Jesus Christ to be exalted, my name to perish? Do I guard against bringing reproach on the name of Christ? God's appointed Jesus heir of all things. I'm a joint heir with him, Romans 8 says. Do I live as if I'm concerned about what people think of Jesus Christ because of me? See, Paul's concerned about these the names, the reputation of the teachers even around whom the cliques have formed. You see, every true gospel minister, Paul, Apollos, Peter, is Christ's gift to his whole church, not just to the group, the group that likes them. Rivalry and jealously. Needless and unfit. How little the Corinthians appreciated their Christian privileges is pointed out again in 1 Corinthians 6 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world's to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? We're going to look at that when we get to 1 Corinthians 6, what he's talking about there. Jesus said in John 6 38, I'll close with this. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, the Son of God, was conscious of the need to please his Father. How can the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, bought by the blood of Christ, the very Christ sent by God to die for his church, how can we be any less concerned to please our Savior, to please our Father, to think about how His glory, His smile, should shape and influence and drive our thinking and our actions. That's the only way it can be, brothers and sisters. We're God's holy temple. We're built upon the foundation of Christ's work. By His grace, we are filled with His Holy Spirit. We must face the fact that we are capable of immaturity and guard our hearts against that. But the good news is that wherever your journey's been, repentance will bring you back to the heart of of what the Lord saved you to be and to do. Repentance. That's the good news. You see, the, the worst, most divisive church member you've ever known need only repent unto God and be brought back and restored and you show the glory of God in the recovery of the wayward. That's the gospel. The gospel is not about how well I perform. The gospel is about how I respond to the perfect holy performance of Jesus Christ who died for my sins and rose from the grave. Do you know this gospel today? Perhaps you've been saved by grace through faith, but you've forgotten some of these things and, and it's let, it, you've let it take you afield, away from, from the heart of God's desire for His church. Don't let the devil beat you up. Just repent. Repent and return. Perhaps you've heard the gospel, but you've never really responded savingly to the gospel. It's never had a life-changing, mind-gripping, heart-wrenching encounter to change you. Repent. Just repent today and believe Jesus Christ as God's remedy for our sin condition. And you'll be saved. But know this. God loves His church. He does not take kindly to anyone who would harm 
his church. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we come to you in Jesus' name. And, oh, we read this, and Lord, I, I tremble. Help me to love and care for and nurture that which you love. Help me not to use my energies to undermine and destroy that which you love. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that the same. I pray for those who are not yet followers of Christ that they would see the, the gravity of this, the seriousness of this, and would confess 